than to maintain a small family, especially in these days when the influence of Kali Yuga is so strong that everyone is harassed and full of anxiety because of accepting the false presentation of Maya's family. The family which we maintain is created by Maya. It is the perverted reflection of the family in Krishna Loka. In Krishna Loka there are also family, friends, society, father and mother. Everything is there, but they are eternal. Here as we change bodies, our family relationships also change. Sometimes we are in the family of human beings, sometimes in a family of demigods, sometimes a family of cats, and sometimes a family of dogs. Family, society, and friendship are flickering, and so they are called asat. It is said that as long as we are attached to this asat, temporary, non-existing society and family, we are always full of anxiety. The materialists do not know that the family, society, and friendship here in this material world are only shadows, and thus they become attached. Naturally, their hearts are always burning, but in spite of all inconvenience, they still work to maintain such false families because they have no information of the real family association with Krishna. Sandhaya mana sarvanga esham udvahanadina karocha viratam mudho turitani turasayo. Although he is always burning with anxiety, such a fool always performs all kinds of mischievous activities with a hope which is never to be fulfilled in order to maintain his so called family and society. So the first line of the purport of Srila Prabhupada is very deep. It is said that it is easier to maintain a great empire than to maintain a small family, especially in these days. Maintaining a family is very difficult because one has to uh, act on the platform of some kind of loving relationship and trust, which doesn't exist in Kali Whereas in empire, you run it by government, bureaucracy, force, law, police state. So it's easy. That which is made by force is easier to maintain than that which is made by love. And anyway, love in this material world, just a perverted reflection of lust. Therefore, in the Kali Yuga, as soon as the lusty desires are diminished for some reason or another in the family relationship, it becomes almost impossible to maintain it anymore. But if somehow one is able to maintain his family relationships, then he becomes very attached. Or he is attached, therefore he does maintain them one or the other. Now, we can examine this in different ways because it's interesting. How a person may be a family member and even though he's a total envious person, we're still attached. There are many instances of a person taking birth in the family of his enemy just to harass him like anything as a family member. Because when someone's your family member, even though in your previous lifetime you were enemies number one, because one is attached. Why? Because this person has come from my body. My body, which is not me, has produced, which it hasn't really, this person. He, therefore, is part of me which he's not. Therefore, I am very much attached to this person. Which is also untrue because you're not attached to the person. Your body is attached to his body because the chemicals had some kind of source from your body. So it is amazing how if somebody was an envious rascal in last lifetime, if he takes birth in your family, you accept him. Willingly, readily, gladly. 
And that person naturally creates havoc in the family. We have many instances of that, of the children in the family wrecking havoc in the family, naturally. So one can only imagine that from previous lifetimes, there is a need for the children to do like that to these persons because they were enemies. Now, of course, in every case there may be some other cause, but this is a very real cause. In fact, this is the cause which is mentioned in the Vedas in many examples. So, we find that our attachments in these family affairs are based on illusion because nobody is family member. In this material world, everybody is uh, in illusion. We all think, this person's in my family, that person's not, when in fact, everybody's in the family of Krishna, no one's in your family. Or put another way, no one's in your fa no one's in anyone's family, because it's temporary. If I am in a family today, I die, then I go to another family. So I don't belong to anybody's family. I don't belong to anybody. Because I belong to Krishna, nobody can take me away. Therefore, I may accept the position in someone's family temporarily, but I can never belong in that family because I belong to Krishna. Therefore, when we are in the spiritual world, we can also be in the family of Krishna. Because everybody's related to Krishna. He's everyone's relative. That's what it means, the absolute relative. Everybody is related to him. Because he's the supreme source. We're all in his family. Everybody comes from Krishna, ultimately. And there are also family relationships in the spiritual sky, but they're eternal. No one is father, no one is mother, but it seems like that. Sometimes uh, nobody is brother, nobody is sister, but it seems like that. Because these Creations are there by Krishna's internal potency for the pleasure of the devotees. And those relationships are eternal. Pleasure of the devotees, pleasure of Krishna. And these eternal relationships are very much uh, appreciated because they never are diminished by lusty desires, frustrations, angers, fighting. But in this material world, every relationship is in danger of being destroyed at any moment. Why? Because we are not related on the material platform at all. Therefore, Prabhupada uses the word here, false family. Because it's not really our family. It's just like some seaweed that comes together on the shore, being thrown up by the waves. But when the next wave comes, it grabs that seaweed and pulls it back in again, scattering it. So that when the next wave comes, the seaweed comes together with another clump. Similarly, family members are those who come together temporarily by the influence of time, destiny, and they depart at the end of this lifetime by the influence of destiny. And next lifetime, a new set of family members may assemble. Unless one is so much attached that he can't live next lifetime without the other members of the family. Then they will take birth again together. So, temporarily combining, temporarily in a very limited period of time, we are very much absorbed in thinking, this is my family. Here is my father, here is my mother, here is my sister, here is my brother, here is my aunt and uncle and cousins, and here is my wife, 
and here are my children, and here are their children, and here are their children's 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 children. And this is all my family. And then at death, the material nature just flings it away. And it is your family no longer, and a new set of persons become your family. Therefore, family is an illusion. Society is the same thing. Groups of families together make society. But groups of false things do not make a true thing. Many groups of false things make the big false group. And that's called society. Nation. All of it is simply illusory. Because it does not touch the eternal nature of things. Illusory, society, nation, family, friends, all based on the body alone. And these bodily relationships are temporary. Now, what's happening? We get full of anxiety and the heart is burning. Burning with anxiety. Sandhyamana. <laughs> Sarvanga. Instead, very literally, yeah. Sarva Anga, all of his limbs are always burning. Now, of course, that doesn't mean with fire or something like that. Of course, it does mean the fire of lust. But it means that he's always got to work. He's always engaged in maintaining that family situation. Either by working outside, getting money, or working hard to keep peace, or working hard to please others in the family. He's got to work and he's burning that way. And similarly, he may be burning in this material nature with lusty desires, trying to satisfy them through the network of the family affairs. That also doesn't work. So, now what? pretty drastic situation we have here. Being too much detached in the material world, we're bound up hand and foot in anxiety, yet finding no way out of the anxiety. What is the solution? Then let's give it all up. Let's renounce everything. Everybody takes on yes. But that doesn't work either, because uh, renunciation, which is immature, brings havoc in spiritual life. One has to act according to realization. Then, what's to be done? Giving up is not the solution, because one doesn't give up. One may walk away from one way to walk to another one because one doesn't give up. When one is really giving up, that is, of course, a very nice stage. But to simply artificially renounce him, that is not good, because later on one will also have trouble too. So what is the solution? The solution is, well, one will just have to simply become a good Krihasta, <laughs> actually live very nicely in his household life, but with knowledge. That's the difference between Grihasta and Grihamedi. This verse is discussing Grihamedi, one who's burning always in material existence and cannot see his way out of it, full of hopes to satisfy himself in the material existence, and therefore he's performing, as it is stated here, mischievous activities. <laughs> or these two words, three words in the last line are very, very interesting. Mudha, Duritani, Durashaya. Now Prabhupada is translating in the word by word. Of course, the Mudha is the fool. So this person who's acting like this, he's the Mudha. And Duritani, this refers to the sinful activities he performs. 
Nunam Pramatta Kurute Vikarma. Dur, do, do, this prefix means very bad. So, this person is engaged in very bad activity, sinful activity. And his mind is evil. One may say, no, no, people are good. But here Bhagavatam is saying, such a person who's simply interested in his body and nothing more than that is evil-minded. Why? Because that's the demoniac mentality. Nothing more than the body. That's evil-minded. Sinful activity. Not very good. Therefore, persons who are of the this category are grihamedi. Griheshu grihamedi nam. Apashitam atmatatam. Blind to self-realization. They are simply attached to home, family, society, nation, love, and nothing more. The difference between Grihamedi and Grihasta is one is simply using the home as a field for sense gratification. And Grihasta sta, means situated or maintaining. He's maintaining a home as an ashrama. We call it the grihastha ashrama. Maintenance of home as ashrama. But there's no such thing as grihamedi ashrama. It's grihamedi existence. But the grihastha maintains his home as an ashrama. What is an ashrama? It is a place for spiritual development. Now one may say, how can you have spiritual development if you are living with your wife? That is a good question. But that is what Grihastha Ashram is all about. And therefore one has to learn the art of knowledge to see others as spirit souls, assistance in the art of surrendering to Krishna and maintain service to Krishna by being enthusiastic, not being morose. Oh, why I don't have family. So, one is morose, why I don't have family. Then he gets family, then he's morose. Oh, why do I have family? So, now one does. So therefore, one should use this as an inspiration in Krishna consciousness. This is the art of surrender. A devotee uses everything positively in Krishna's service. This is the art of surrender. It is not easy. We never said it was easy. It is trouble. Just like when one is lamenting, Oh, I don't have family. There's a burden on one's shoulder. The lamentation of not having, hankering. Then, one transfers the burden to the other shoulder. Oh, now I have this burden. He's moved it from one side to the other side. But that's part of the necessity of life. When it's too much pain on one side, you move it to the other side. And when it's too much pain on that side, one takes up vanaprasa. And even if there's not enough pain at age of 50 anyway, take up Vanapa. And then later on, full renunciation may develop by transcendental knowledge. So anyway, this material world is no fun. Everybody should know that. Brahmacharis who are lamenting, they should understand it's not fun. And Grihastas you just look, they're lamenting too. They've got what you think you want. And look, they don't want it anymore either. Every man is thinking, oh, if I just had another wife, then I would be happy. There's an interesting little anecdote in this connection. There's one town, uh, 
And for the life of me, I can't remember where it is. Maybe it's in America, and maybe it's in France, but anyway, I can't remember. But it had a tradition from 300 years. 300 years ago, the deacon in the town proclaimed, I guess it's deacon, what's that? You have, you understand this word, deacon? Yes? No? He's uh, like the, the priest who takes care of affairs. Like here in Sweden you have some, but at that time they were a little bit more powerful. So, he said, I have a prize here. So and so much money. Something like a thousand dollars or something. Enormous, big prize. For that family who will come and swear before the cross during their first year of marriage neither of them ever lamented getting married to that person in 300 years it was used twice that really says something you know And probably those two were lying somehow. <laughs> Just needed the money. So one starts lamenting like this. So I ask, and everybody should understand, I ask, where is the happiness in the material world? And what's the answer? There isn't any. Then one asks, then how to go on living like this? And the answer is, we have no idea. We don't know how the materialists do it. Therefore, they get intoxicated like anything. To forget. And if it's not intoxication, by heavy drugs, you know, the kinds that are illegal, it's intoxication by the ones that are legal. The market for barbiturates. Yeah. You know those things? They make you very depressed, or not depressed, what do you call it? You know, dull. Dull. People think that's a good state. You'll be very, very dull. They're like a stone. The more you become like a stone, the better it is. Because then you can forget. They found in America that 90% of the housewives were physically addicted to barbiturates. But they sell them in forms which are as if they were like nerve pills or, or you know, tension tablets or anxiety relievers or, and it says, take two or as desired. So they take 20. And they're all addicted like this. Housewives. Everybody wants to be dull. And then there's the TV to make you really dull. Oh, really dull. All of that radiation coming out of that machine there, bouncing off your brain. And all of these completely dull images, sterile in a glass tube. One surrenders his mind to it. It becomes dull like a stone. The whole material world is meant for dulling one from the pain of the material nature. That's how the materialists handle it. Or otherwise they become big speculators and speculate it's all one. Or in some places, not very much in our part of Europe, but in some places, they become religious fanatics and give up all thinking even about their philosophy. And they just believe. I believe. Why, sir? No need why. I've seen the light. I've been born again. But why, sir? I got the mercy. 
no philosophy. It's all just mercy, and I was born again, and I feel it in my heart. And can you feel it? And they get together, they have these big, big recitals, they have big, big um, revivals. And they have these super expert men. I was once forced to watch one of these fellows. They just sing sentimental songs, playing the piano. Everybody's singing together. And then he stands there and he's giving a lecture, my brothers, my sisters. And he takes the Bible and he pounds it with his fist and raises it in the air and flings it here and there and runs back and forth on the stage and says, Hallelujah, I'm going back to the And all the people are going, Yeah, brother, yeah! <laughs> then he says, Who wants to be saved? I know out there there are sinners amongst you. You did this, you did that, you did the other thing, didn't you? You want to be saved? Come forward, my children. <laughs> then they all gather there at the stage. Then they do some more things. Then they raise their, lower their head, and they repeat some prayer. And then he says, you've been saved! And then they're all, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> It's amazing. And will any one of them change any of their sinful activities? And do they know what is sinful activity? And do they have any idea about any philosophy behind what they just did? It's amazing. That's another form of intoxication. Another form of intoxication. There are of course, Marx said it. Religion is the opiate of the masses. It's like an opium. You just believe, have hope, have faith, and in the end, you'll go back to heaven. So don't worry about your suffering condition now, because later on you'll get everything you want. Therefore, just work for us. So that's why Marx criticized. So therefore, we find there are various forms of opiates. There's religious opiate, if you like. There's entertainment opiates. TV, movies, music. Entertainment opiates. Then there's the ones that are made of fluid liquids. And those that come in the forms of pills. But the material world runs on the principle of this opiate. And above all, the greatest form of intoxication is the family. One becomes really dull in family affairs. You have to be. Now don't mind this, but you have to be. Why? How can you tolerate kids screaming and yelling and bashing each other and all day long in the house unless you are dull is it not huh? how can anybody tolerate you fellows <laughs> all day long they never stop very proud of yourselves, aren't you? So, <clears throat> we find that the Bhagavatam is trying to wake us up out of this dull condition. Dull condition. And trying to bring us up to the platform of knowledge. Wake up, sleeping soul. Wake up. You're so much attached in this position. But little do you know that this will cause unlimited trouble for you and anxiety. Therefore, just try and serve Krishna. And the Bhagavatam does not say, give up everything, go take sannyas. Lord Brahma says, Tane sita sutikrita tanuvan manobhir. Whatever situation of life you're in, 
from that situation you just chant the holy name of the Lord or fix your mind on Krishna. Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, Grihe Thakur, Bone Thakur, Sada Hori Bolo Thakur. Don't try and change your position. Whatever position is there, use it by engaging and chanting Krishna's name, hearing Krishna's pastimes. Otherwise, how will one make any satisfaction by just changing? That's what the karmis do. They just get married to one, then they don't like. So they divorce and get married to another, then they don't like. Nowadays, they don't even bother getting married. Just live with one for a while until that's seen to be useless. Kick that one out of the house. Live with another one until that one's useless. Kick that one out of the house. This is the material world, always changing and never satisfied. Movie stars, seven, eight different wives or husbands. <laughs> and it's just considered to be normal. So, therefore, in spiritual life, we don't have this divorce. Why? Even if you think things are just too tough. Well, that's the austerity of life. Not somehow or another. They were not born, but they were. Everybody knows it. But they weren't. They were always this way. This is called Yoga Maya. Try and understand. They're never born. They're always always children, always parents. They were never born. But they all know completely, perfectly well, this is my mother, this is my father. This is called Yoga Maya. It's Krishna's energy. He covers them in this way so that they may enjoy his pastimes. No, they didn't. They know it. They know they did. But they didn't. Not just think, they know. <laughs> and those children know, and everybody else knows too. Because it's Yoga Maya. Now you know. No. <laughs> you don't need a pucha. You got Prabhupada. You're being taken out by Prabhupada. You don't need a son to take you out. Really, there are no children in the spiritual world. Wow. I wonder who Krishna is playing with then. Someone said that someone said that maybe perhaps that someone said that maybe it's maybe perhaps that this and maybe the someone that this that perhaps and what if and this and that and... And even if it's there, there are no children. But there are children. They're not children. These are not children. The friends of Krishna are not children. Now we have to move forward to another platform, which I didn't want to get into because it's too complicated, but now we have to get into it. There's Goloka and there's Gokula. In Goloka... Everything is big, grand, opulent. And Krishna is Nava Yovana. He's always of the age of blooming fresh youth, 16. And all of his friends and the gopis, they're all basically of the same age. So there are no children. 
because they are youths. They are not considered children. Now in Gokula, there is something here in Gokula, I mean, yeah, Gokula, which means this manifested Vrindavan on this platform, which is not there in Goloka, which makes it sweeter for certain devotees. The trees are smaller and less opulent, but more beautiful, more tasty. And everything is in a different scale, but very much sweeter. And there only does Krishna display his childhood pastime. And there all of the children are. But they are always going with Krishna. Many of them. There are millions of them. Many of them are always going with Krishna from universe to universe to universe. It's like Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj. They are eternally Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj. And eternally, it's the same Mother Yashoda and the same Nanda Maharaj who go from universe to universe. It's the same Arjuna, Yudhisthira, Bhima, Nakula, and Sadev who go from universe to universe with Krishna in Krishna's traveling roadshow. That is the way they are in the spiritual world and always associating with Krishna in their childhood pastime. As they go from universe to universe. It's always the spiritual world. Don't think if Krishna is here that it's anything less than the spiritual world. It's the spiritual world. Except there are some demons there. But that's not bad. That's more fun. Because Krishna kills them. And that's wonderful. Now one starts speculating like anything. So stop speculating. Love and separation is worth more for that devotee who's absorbed in Krishna. Don't try and bring down the spiritual understanding into some box where you can examine it according to rational means. Don't make that mistake. These things have to be realized. And when they are realized, they make perfect sense. To, and, uh, and Everything's very clear. But until that point, it'll never be clear by discussion even though it's very clear. You know what I mean? No. Okay, anyway. Just <laughs> if one thinks about the spiritual pastimes, the spiritual activities of Krishna's associates, he cannot tolerate the attachments of the material relationships. Therefore, he'll never accept these Therefore, he develops Krishna consciousness, even in these relationships, and demands it of others, too. That's another subject that we could go on for another hour or two. This is your, la your, your visa for questions is running out after this one. Okay. This is good to think about who? Bhima. It's just as good. They're not different. No, to talk about and to, yes, but we don't meditate on Bhima. But there's a difference there. Yeah. Yes, you, you, we talk about Krishna's devotees and that is Krishna Katha because whatever they're doing is in relationship to Krishna. Therefore, if you talk about somebody who's, doing some, who's only relating with Krishna or talking about Krishna, then obviously you're talking about Krishna too. Because when you relate what they say, then you're only talking about Krishna too. Therefore, it's just as good. But that does not mean that we now make meditation on Bhima we, our temple always has Krishna. And neither would Bhima like that very much. He wouldn't be very impressed by your worship. He'd say, why are you not worshipping Krishna? How do the gopis' husbands react when Krishna calls them away? They flip out completely. 
Where do you think you are going? Uh, uh, I'll be back later. Where are you going? Come back here. You can't run out like this in the middle of the night. That's how they react. The gopis, they just drop their baby. And all you mothers out there, gopis may be holding their babies and breastfeeding them, right? What could be more motherly and traditional? And Krishna blows his flute, they just drop them on the floor. Boom! <laughs> and they get up and go. Try and understand the difference. Don't in any way ever think there's a similarity between this platform and that. What mother is going to do that? <gasps> Boom! Drop your worshipful baby on the floor. Boom! All the milk is boiling over on the stove. Husbands are screaming. Relatives are threatening. If you go, don't come back. We don't care. Krishna. Didn't even in the, in the slightest lament. And they said that to Krishna too. He said, what are you girls doing out here in the middle of the night? Don't you have any culture? Don't you understand? I'm a a young boy and you're young girls and this is the Sharat season, the full moon, very beautiful, in the forest, in the middle of the night, alone. Don't you understand this is not proper? Don't you know the principles of religion? You should go back immediately to your husbands and your families who certainly are lamenting in your absence. You have neglected them and left them. The gopis just looked at the ground and drew semicircles with their toes. And they said, Krishna, because they didn't want to chastise him, after all. They came just for him. They said, we, you, you called us here. We only came because you called us. And we can't go back anyway. They all rejected us. They knew it. Our family members, they've all rejected us. We can't go back anyway. So how can you say such an absurd proposition? And Krishna was just testing them, that's all. It was... It was enjoyable to make them fearful. They said, oh no, oh no. And then give release to that fear. Yes, it's all all right, come on. This just makes the heart just... Uh. <laughs> you can't understand it, don't even bother Unless there's some advancement there. You can't understand this, how Krishna does this with his associates. And they just, their heart just becomes like used by Krishna. And they love that. If somebody else uses your heart, you're just like, what? Get out. No. And the gopis just presented their hearts to Krishna and say, please use us as you like. And then, at the end, they went back home and husbands didn't say anything. Relatives didn't say anything. Babies didn't have any bruises. Nobody even knew it happened. Yoga Maya. <laughs> but it's not like the gopis knew that beforehand. When I go, I can come back because Krishna will cover the whole thing up. They thought, we have just finished off our entire material existence. No husband will ever take us back again. Our fathers and mothers will reject us. Our children will hate us. Nobody will ever take us again and we will not go back, ever. Krishna has called us, now we are finished. We are just with Krishna. No one else, ever, finished. That's how they thought. But Krishna sent them back the next day of Brahma and everything went on just as if nothing had happened before. So don't think we can understand Krishna's pastimes, devotees, position in this very simplistic way. It's very hard. One has to be very careful.
They didn't even care. He may be whatever he may be, but that's my wife. The husbands of the gopis are not very advanced. I mean, they're advanced, but they're not as advanced as the gopis. And those who were halted, stopped from going by their husbands, they just left the body on the spot. And they went in their spiritual body to dance with Krishna. They just gave up the body. Husbands were left with a dead shell. So much is the attachment from to the gopis to Krishna. It is inconceivable, impossible to describe. And therefore, we don't even try. And how can you think of your mundane household affairs after knowing about Krishna and his affairs with his associates? Hari Krishna.